do that. Uh, all right, well, first, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Bob uh, and IPC Design Council for allowing us to host this event. Uh, we're really looking forward to hearing from Zukin uh, and uh, Scott uh, from Optimum Design. I think it's going to be a great event today. Uh, so uh, I'm from Footprint Coup, and um, just a little bit of background about myself. I've been in hardware electronics for about 20 years. Uh, the majority of my time has been spent about 15 years in uh, PCB uh, development and, and engineering services related. So during this time, um, of course, 15 years actually compared to some of the veterans here is really just a fraction of that. I'm at my infancy stage still. Uh, but what I've noticed is there, you know, although we have a lot of um, amazing breakthrough in products that are coming to market, the processes that are being used has relatively remained stagnant. It's been very, very incremental in change, um, specifically in the space of library development. Um, so that's what Footprint Coup is about. So Footprint Coup is a service provider of building component libraries. Uh, so uh, I, just a couple of minutes, I'll just go through something uh, very brief. And uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, please, uh, you can look for me. Uh, after the event, um, or my contact information is, is right over here, chico.wu at footprintcrew.com. So everyone knows that when you're going through your design, you're selecting your components, right? It starts with that PDF spec sheet. Everything is that it originates from that component spec. Problem with that is as, uh, as devices are becoming more and more advanced functionality-wise, the, the burden on the industry, the burden on all of you, whether it's engineers, designers, or librarians, becomes heavier and heavier because your product to market is shrinking from two years to one, and one year to six months now. That cycle time of creating a product is uh, going beyond even faster than what we can keep up with in competition-wise. That's me. <laughs> so. What is this? And I don't think I need to explain this. I think we all understand what the process is, right? Spec sheet, converting that, digitizing that, redrawing a component, whether it's a standard rule set uh, or, in many cases, custom DFA rule sets because your manufacturer has some requirements that will be more ideal for efficiency, yield optimization. When it comes to that kind of scenario, there really hasn't been too much advance in technology. Everything is still very manually generated with some additional skills and tools that have been able to supplement what we're doing. We looked at it from a completely different approach and we said, what technology is available today? And we have been able to harness a lot of automation and look at artificial intelligence technology, uh, specifically ML, uh, machine learning, um, some neural networks, and we're building our skill set, or we're building our robot. Uh, our robot is Robot Coup, hence the name Footprint Coup, and he works in the background in addition with a person to create your digital data, uh, which is consisting of schematic symbols, PCB footprints, and your 3D step. Some of the data is available, you can pull off online, but when it comes to mapping them, your orientation, your X, Y, your, your uh, zero, zero, and your datum coordinates, mapping that 3D to a footprint is a very tedious task. Uh, we've been able to automate that as well. So essentially our service is bringing in your part request through a PDF component spec sheet, turning that around with your customization rules, and delivering the trifecta of the three uh, in a variety of CAT platforms. Uh, so you're receiving the native, uh, database, like native data that drop into your, your board, continue with your placing route. Uh, so that's Footprint Code in a nutshell. Uh, I have a short two-minute video clip that I'd like to just run through. It gives you a quick idea of what, what the system is. It's, it's a part request dashboard, essentially. It's, it's browser-based, um, and here it is.
So we try to create a GUI that's very, very user friendly. Essentially, it's you take a batch of PDFs and you drag and drop, whether it's 10 or 50, uh, our, our cycle time is 24 hours, no longer than 48 hours, and you'll receive the entire set uh, with your customized rules built into that. So again, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Uh, this is my information over here, and I'll uh, hand it back to Bob. All right, thank you very much, Jigo. Um, now I'm gonna bring up Martin, Martin Greer. He's he works for Zukin, and uh, so just give a big round for Zukin for sponsoring the lunch. Thank you. segment we call Sponsor Spotlight. Uh, I, don't, I don't, everybody can hear me. I don't think I need to use the, uh, the microphone, but, um, I will wait for that to go into lunch and mode. Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Martin Greer and I am technical account manager with Zukin. Um, I think by now everybody knows all the players. They know what an EDA company is and they know what e EDA companies do. Um, so I just wanted to just kind of introduce, first of all, it's our pleasure to be co-hosting uh, today's event with, uh, with Footprint Coop. And I did want to mention uh, a, few, a few comments about, um, about Zukin. Working? Yeah. So, you know, we, we see as our mission statement that, you know, we are really vested in our customer's success. It is our developing the design technology and the data management solutions to make our customers successful is really what we're all about. It, our customer success is our business. We've been in this business for over 40 years. You know, we started off in 1976 with our first generation CAD. CADM systems, you know, and have been reinventing the technology that we put to market ever since. You know, we really take this seriously, um, and we do a lot of of, of investment of um, of our resources into development activities. We have annual uh, revenues of over 27 billion yen. We're uh, listed on the Tokyo Stock Exchange. We are an, an engineering-driven organization. And uh, what's actually one of the things I really like about Zukin is that um, we do um, invest very heavily in the technology. So if you haven't, if you haven't really looked at the Zukin technology recently, I would uh, advise you to really take a good look at the Zukin technology. In fact, one of the things that Zukin has invested in is uh, we have you know seven development centers worldwide. But um, a few years ago, we actually opened specifically what what we call the Sozo Center. And the Sozo Center was was um, set up specifically in Silicon Valley in order to partner with forward-thinking companies in order to generate or uh, work on the technologies that we are going to be needing to bring to market over the for the for the next generation of, of innovations. So the Sozo Center is actually working on partnerships and working on ad more advanced technologies. And, and we've already been bringing to market some of the inve inventions and you know, the innovations that have come out of the Sozo Center. Our technology, is, as everybody will say, you know, we're, we're used in a, pretty much everywhere. You know, it's a very diverse uh, industries. I mean, we're power plants all the way to IoT to, to biotech. And, and I think, you know, we, we our technology is, is pretty much used everywhere. Now, um, I think it's, when you look at uh, like kind of what our products, how our products break down, you know, you kind of segment, you know, logical, physical design, and obviously our CR8000 platform um, really plays in the, uh, the, 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 the PCB and system design space. It's, you know, capable of doing uh, multi-design, multi-board package chip, uh, the R chip RDL um, package and board simultaneously. This is, this is what we refer to as, as true co-design. This technology was developed this century um, and was 3D from the get-go and makes use of all of the latest uh, capabilities um, of the, the modern architecture. So this is extensible uh, technology that is really capable. Our E3 solution, which is our cable and harnessing, um, is a, uh, is, is uh, well, sorry, uh, is, is a complete electrical and fluid dynamic um, 
solution for uh, concept to manufacturing. It's, we've it links to um, MCAD system for true uh, 3D cable uh, um, harness creation and product life cycle management. But on top of everything else, you know, it's really important that you get the data in process. So managing, you know, our, our DS2 solutions, um, which is our uh, library and data management solutions, it provides data desi design collaboration and ECAD library synchronization links to the PLM system for uh, for integration with and control over your uh, supply chain. So our, our, our solutions really are 3D uh, product-centric, design-capable um, collaboration inside and out, and connectivity with the supply chain and the PLM systems. Um, I. Uh, I don't want to really go into too much detail on each of the individual because I kind of feel like, you know, um, you're not really here for a product pitch, you know, and I would prefer to, to just say that we have a tightly integrated um, solution environment, you know, from, from system planning, which will allow your, your systems engineers to do what-if analysis and make trade-offs and evaluate different options. And all of those constraints and, and parameters that, that you have as associated with a particular, the best architecture can be forward annotated into your design environment. In the design environment, you can do the design uh, evolution, um, design ver verification with simulation, um, and then take that into the implementation phase where you know, we, we have excellent uh, technology for, for placement, routing, design checking, even 3D checking, and um, where, and then you can go into the manufacturing checks where we do manufacturing checks um, and assembly checks um, to, for, uh, to ensure that your designs are manufacturable. We integrate with um, third parties. We have very tight working relationships with third parties like Keysight and ANSYS. In fact, we have uh, uh, RF flows that allow you to um, start your, doing your design in the, the, the environment that is most appropriate and then do uh, and then do design integration um, for uh, for checking and manufacturing. So we actually integrate at multiple levels. We've integrated at the, not only the library level, but at the logical as well as the physical level, so that we support multiple design flows for specialized solutions. Um, we have an ongoing relationship with these companies. In fact, we're doing a uh, a collaborative WebEx um, next month. Uh, no, uh, November 13th, we're going to be doing a joint WebEx with Keysight on um, in DDR5. And in fact, you can go online to register for that. Um, it is called uh, Be First to Market with DDR5. So from aligning your supply chain and managing your infrastructure to making the trade-offs on your architecture to taking your design through the rigors of implementation to getting, putting this all together and making this manufacturable, there is one company that will be there with you every step of the way. I knew I would be brief. And uh, now we can actually get on to what we all really came here to hear about, which is uh, our keynote speaker. So thank you, guys. So now we're going to bring up um, Scott Nance. And I guess his son Adam's going to help him out here. Scott's a uh, senior director or director of PCB layout at Optimum Design Associates. He's been there since 2005. You can read all the rest of his bio in the uh, intermediate. So, but anyway, this is Scott Nance. Thank you, Bob. Ben, I'm Scott Nance from Optimum Design. I've uh, been apprentice circuit designer for 35 years. And uh, it's really fantastic being in a room full of PCB designers. You're the only people that get them. Um, I work for Optimum Design. They're a, they're a, we are we have 20 designers, and an, we are an EMS house. Uh, I've considered myself very lucky to be in this industry, and I've considered myself very be lucky to be working for Optimum for the second half of my career. The first half of the career was uh, independent, and I got to work with some of the best microwave and analog engineers. Uh, this is really the best industry because we all share amongst ourselves. I, I don't see you know 
any kind of competitiveness. We, we always try to share what has helped us in our endeavors. And I think uh, that's the vein that my boss, Nick, is allowing us to talk to all you good people about. And that's uh, really the only vein is to be altruistically helping you by giving us, giving you just the tidbits that have helped us uh, get some of these high speed and RF designs and these tougher and tougher designs to work uh, first shot out of the barrel. And so uh, with that, I'd like to start my presentation. Thank you, Adam. So again, we, we got some of the best designer. We got some of the representation here, but we have some of the best designers in the world working for us. And uh, uh, one of them is Brendan Paris. He wrote an article. He wrote an article or a book, uh, "Practical Guide to RF Mixed uh, Practical Guide to RF and Mixed Technology Printed Circuit Board Layout." And a lot of this presentation is based upon that. And if I could give any advice, it would be to do what I did: work with the best, work for the best, so you can work with the best, and then sponge off them all you can. So, I need my text here. I need my text here. So when I first started, I, I was doing microwave boards that were completely all on their own. Microwave boards were an independent, were an, uh, were an individual board. Digital boards were slow and they were completely separate. So we never really had issues of mixed, mixed technology boards where the RF was being, uh, uh, was, was being corrupted by the noise from the digital. And of course, nowadays, everything's the opposite of that. We have things so tightly packed together that uh, the digital is, is interspersed with the RF so much that you really need to know how to separate the RF from the digital. Are we good? Thank you, sir. And so that's what I want to do today is walk through some of the, the, the unique challenges of a mixed signal design. Uh, the theme that I'd like to do is information integrity. And, and basically what that is doing, what that means is protecting the data from the noise. So in, in digital, digital has a, a, a threshold, the voltage threshold. So, and, and most digital logic families have some uh, tolerance to the degradation of these parameters, frequency, amplitude, and phase. They are important, but not to the same degree in analog. In analog, Frequency, amplitude, and phase are the data. And in, in digital, by the nature of how square waves are, are created by summing of all the odd harmonics, there's a, there's a lot of noise created in, in, in this uh, creation. And so this noise can be detrimental to the sensitive circuits in the analog and the RF. So the point here being is that the analog system has to be protected from the noise of the digital and not so much vice versa. So analog systems are far more concerned with efficient transfer of power. So they're naturally, uh, they have a lower tolerance to loss. And the noise issues in a mixed signal design are for the large part created by the digital circuitry, uh, with analog being susceptible. And of course, clean power is, is uh, mandatory in any analog system. Uh, we're, we're also, we'll go over some considerations and methods but uh, let, let's start with the issues. And the first issue, of course, of course, would be loss. So an RF board will typically have an attenuation budget associated with it uh, for its insertion loss, and it's rated in dB. Uh, the confidence level in meeting that budget is really what's going to determine what loss mitigation techniques you're going to use. And it's going to be the fiscal budget that really determines how those get applied. People ask me all the time, at what frequency do you need to worry about loss? At what edge rate? And to me, it always boils down to confidence. If the, if the responsible electrical engineer is confident that his levels of attenuation are to be met, we can, we can slack on some of these things. When the, when the confidence level is low, we have to pull out all the stops and meet our attenuation budgets by, by making all the necessary uh, techniques in layout. So, Dielectric loss is a function of the selected material. There's nothing really the designer can do about this. Um, it's proportional to frequency, and it's quantified on, on the material's dis, uh, spec sheet as dissipation factor, and this is also called sometimes lost tangent. Return loss is quite possibly the biggest contributor loss in an RF system. 
it's the it's also the one the designer the PCB designer can do the most to combat uh, return loss reflection coefficient VSWR or visor are all measures of impedance mismatch and of course impedance varies with frequency I love this formula this formula is, is showing the importance of of maintaining a continuous characteristic impedance of your transmission lines. Th this symbol right here, rho, that P, that stands for reflection coefficient. And it is, so there's two formulas here. Rho is two things. It's either the ratio of the reflected over the incident wave, or it's also the same exact formula is the ratio of the load impedance to the characteristic impedance of, of, the, of the line. And what's interesting to me about this is what it points out is that in RF, an impedance mismatch is a reflection. Skin effect is another type of loss, and um, it contributes to loss. It effectively increases resistance, creating heat. So the higher the frequency of a signal on a transmission line, the smaller amount of that copper is going to be used to carry that signal. Due to increased magnetism, the current is forced to the edge of that signal, and it's going to condense on the side next to the reference plane. So you can see how copper roughness adds length to the signal. And this is adding inductance, and the increased length can also affect your timing. So copper, we'll discuss it a little bit later, but, but uh, copper smoothness is, is what we're after and which side of the copper that we're using and always being aware of where the reference plane is and where the skin effect uh, is, is making the current condense. So next, we'll touch on some noise now. So it's really advantageous to understand where all the current loops are in your design. Uh, we, we try, uh, all high frequency loops, we try to minimize the size as much as possible. Multiple system grounds is a, uh, it, it's a little confusing, but really what it's about is, is a transmission line, a switching signal crossing over a split in two planes and then referencing two different planes. And what that can do is create a voltage potential across the two planes, and now you can create a patch antenna out of that. So two things to really think about EMI when we're designing mixed signal is that large current loops can create, can uh, become efficient loop antennas and multiple system grounds can become efficient patch antennas. Two things we're trying to keep away from when we're designing for low EMI. Coupling, two different kinds of coupling here, um, conducted and radiated. Conducted might mean where we have a trace in our analog section that is, has digital noise on it and it's in the uh, area of analog, and the other one is radiated, where possibly the digital is too close to the analog or it's not properly isolated, and we're getting the noise radiated into the analog, and that's where it's being picked up. And so we want to identify victims and aggressors in this realm, but it can be confusing because any, any given signal could potentially be a victim and an aggressor. So in shielding, a, a Faraday cage uh, blocks the E-field portion of the electromagnetic wave and capacitively couples this to ground. Um, it, this energy just doesn't magically disappear. Uh, we do want to think about when, when, when we have a Faraday cage or a Faraday shield, how this energy is going to return back to the ground input. And we don't want to run that through any high gain uh, or low noise amplifiers. And we also want to think about how things are in the shield itself so that the energy is, dis the energy is dissipated back to its source. Magnetic shields are less common. They're, they're very expensive. They are made out of ferrous materials. And in that case, that energy is, is converted to heat. And the point about chassis resonance is that at a certain frequency, uh, uh, a shield will, will have a particular resonance. And so what we want is an asymmetric shape to help not make that happen it is to stop that from resonating. Asymmetric shapes, it, it, the worst co possible scenario is a cube where all the walls are the same size. At a particular frequency, that will resonate. Basically, create, making your shield ineffective at that frequency. So 
So in a digital system, low impedance planes are what we typically want for our digital power delivery system. For RF systems, many cases we have linear supplies or a filter that's right next to the device. So we're going to hook that up with a low inductance trace. Typically we don't use power planes for them, but, but we do in some instances. If we do use a small power plane to power our RF circuits, again, we want to make that an asymmetric shape as well. We want to make that so that it has a lower chance of becoming a patch antenna. Low level, high gain circuits are very prone to noise on the power supply and great care has to be taken in, in laying these out. It's, it's the high gain, low noise amplifiers that you're going to see that we're going to really work on removing all the parasitics, the capacitance and inductance of the leads, clearing out the planes on the backside of, of layer one pads, things of that nature. Uh, and the coupling and bypass caps are, are discrete. The, the, you may connect to those two differently. And I'll talk about decoupling first. So here we see a digital chip with some high-speed IOs here on the left. There's a lot of high-speed IOs. If those, if those high-speed IOs were switching very slowly, this power supply, which is at some distance away from our device, might be able to supply the current necessary quick enough for these high-speed IOs. But if those IOs are simultaneously switching, and they're switching very fast, it's going to be unlikely that this power supply is going to be able to deliver the necessary current fast enough. And so what we see then is a drop in voltage on the plane. This repeated drop and rise of voltage on the plane is a voltage transient. And this noise, this voltage transient, is a manifestation of demand for current. So our initial current must come from our interplane capacitance or probably more likely our decoupling caps. So the lowest value capacitor is placed closest to deliver the highest speed current demand. And it does this through the lowest impedance path, which, which should be our power delivery planes. The decoupling cap discharges to that plane and ideally creates no need for the voltage to drop. And so what we've done is we've contained that voltage we've contained that voltage transient locally up to the first decoupling cap. So the point of decoupling is to prevent the noise, the, the, the part of decoupling is to prevent the noise from getting onto the plane past the first decoupling cap, as opposed to bypass caps. So in bypass caps, here we see an analog chip. In bypassing is more about removing existing noise from the power rail before it gets to our device. And we do that with our bypass by picking values that provide a low impedance path to ground for our noise and preferably a short to ground for our noise. Uh, we, and we want this short to happen at the noise frequency. So it's possible that this frequency of noise, the spectrum of noise is too broad for one bypass cap. And so in analog, many times you see a, a bypassing network of several values of, of capacitors. And, uh, We'll, we'll talk about that in a second as well. So useful frequencies of a bypass cap. A bypass cap is only effective up to its self-resonant frequency. And every cap has on a spec sheet what its self-resonant frequency is. Uh, parasitic inductance inside the leads and the body of a capacitor are called ESL. And ESL is, is L, so an L and a C will form a resonant circuit. And this will happen at some frequency. Parasitic resistance in the capacitor body and leads is called ESR. And this isn't always a bad thing. When I talked about the capacitive networks, we can use a higher ESR cap to broaden the effective frequency range of a bypassing network. It's, it's similar to putting a series R to your power rail from your analog device. So low ESR caps are, are good for some things. Higher ESR caps are sometimes good to broaden the effective uh, frequencies of a bypassing network. So parasitic inductance in our copper connections on the board is the reason that we put the lowest value cap closest to the device that we're trying to decouple or bypass. And these are just some examples of some decoupling, some bypassing caps and their, and their useful frequency ranges. Again, up to its self-resonant frequency. Here's some considerations. 
materials. So the, the, these are some pictures of some common fiberglass weaves that we see in our PC board laminates. 1080 is very common. 7628 is a very common board for very thick board, for very thick uh, laminations. One thing you can see real quick with a 1080 is that there's, there, there's holes in there, and so those are going to be filled with resin when it gets laminated. Th that resin in between there has a different dielectric constant than the glass weave. Now, in 7628, that looks better, but it's got a very high z-axis difference. The, the, we the yarns are very thick, and so we get a big variation in, in z-axis height on that one. So what, what, you, what you get is... Uh, there's going to be a when you when you when there's a transmission line crossing these particular weaves, they're going to see uh, a, a a difference, a varying dielectric constant when it's passing over the glass weave as opposed to the resin. And what happens is that uh, these are impedance discontinuities, and those along with the affected propagation velocity is called the fiber weave effect. So, and depending on materials and manufacturers, a lot of materials you can ask for, for better glass weaves. So one thing when we're, when we're designing for high speed or for RF, we're not just looking at materials, we're looking at the glass weaves we're using. We want to optimize the glass weave for, for lower loss if that is what we're after. And depending on the material and the manufacturer, there's going to be different weaves available. Um, and one thing we're looking for, there's a lot of different uh, terminology. Flat weave sounds like something good, but all that means is that the yarn is not twisted. Um, spread weave is what we're after, but not really. Spread weave is they add more fibers in one direction, either the warp or the fill direction. The best possible glass that we want for high speed is something called mechanically spread, MS spread. And 3313 is a good, is a good example of that. We can get that in a mechanically spread uh, pattern, but what we're looking for is, is homogenous and flat and smooth so that our transmission line sees the same dielectric constant everywhere. And this comes really in a lot of play when we're running differential pairs. Differential pairs can have, you know, worst case scenario where you have one signal crossing mostly resin and another, the other half, the complement of your differential pair over glass weave. And the propagation velocities are different on that. And the whole point of differential pairs is, is timing and common noise rejection. Fiber weave can really play havoc with that. So using a better weave and a better material is one way to mitigate the fiber weave effect. Um, but those are costly. There are more economical ways, some old fashioned ways of rotating the boards 10 degrees. Um, in, in reality, you want to look at the weave that you're using and pick the best angle for that weave when, when you are rotating. But, but if you do rotate on that, you can see that you will, you will get rid of the skew between the discontinuities between the two complements of a differential pair by by putting it, by, by routing your traces or by rotating the material at an angle. Uh, again, if you, if, you, if you just routed it vertically across those, you will get a di in, impedance discontinuities at the microscopic level. So this is still more about glass. Uh, the chemical compositions are real important when it comes to glass, when it comes to dielectric constant. They've been doing a lot of work to try to come up with a better glass, but e-glass is really almost exclusively used in all materials, including high-end materials. And this has to do with cost. Uh, any glass is used in like Meg 6 and Nelco and 4013SI. Uh, that, that's a really good uh, second choice. You can see that the dielectric constant, 4.6, is a lot closer to the resins that we're going to see used in, in the materials that we're using. So, so that whole discontinuity thing is mitigated a lot just by using a better glass. Uh, these other glasses, uh, structural for S, D for dial was developed for low dielectric, C was for chemical resistance. Those are all great, but the price increases on all of those. I if price was not an a, a, a impediment, we would all use quartz. Quartz is by far the best, uh, but it is it is forty times the cost of e glass. There's a, there's a formula for calculating the dielectric constant of a laminate, and you can see it up here. It has to do with, the, with how much resin and the glass. So, the, so the, the weave really impacts the glass resin ratio, and so this impacts the, uh, the actual dielectric constant of any particular given layer. 
So you can calculate this yourself. What we recommend is using, using your fabricator to, because they know anecdotal knowledge of how this is gonna really turn into what dielectric constant. Um, it, it affects propagation velocity. And so it, it becomes very important when we're, when we're trying to time high speed signals. And one mistake that I see almost every signal integrity consultant and, and high-end engineers is when it comes time for the dielectric constant, they look at the manufacturer's data sheet and they, they say, this is the dielectric constant of this material. But, but what they don't know is that if you look at it, it's just a given at a random 50% resin content. So the dielectric constant given on a material data sheet is only there for reference for you to refer to other materials and so you can compare. In reality, if you want to be anywhere near close about your propagation velocity, you need to know the dielectric constant of that particular layer. And again, the fabricator can give you this information. Lower dielectric constant materials aren't always better. Um, one of the advantages they do have is that they allow our traces to be wider. And that helps with uh, the loss associated with skin effect and it also helps with etch tolerance, so we get a tighter tolerance on our, on our characteristic impedances. Higher dielectric constant materials are used uh, really a lot by microwave engineers to try to fit their, you can make your, you can make everything smaller now with a high elect, higher dielectric material. And so miniaturization is the trend. If a microwave engineer has a shape uh, that he has uh, created and it's too big to fit on the board, he can change the dielectric constant material of the material and be able to make that shape fit into the, into the necessary space. It, it's also very important to understand how dielectric constant affects the wavelength of the signal propagating on a transmission line up against that. <coughs> Here's just a sample list of some materials ranked by loss. You can see at the top, uh, FR4s, the, these, are going to be lower, these are going to be lower price materials because they're easier to build. Typically, you're going to have more structure and better drilling capabilities. And when you get to lower loss, they have lower structure because that, that affects the dielectric constant of the material. And note that FR4 is not a material that you can get a dielectric constant of. It's just a grade. It just means, it means it's flavor retardant. Uh, it, it really is just a, a, a term used for easily manufacturable and low cost. But you cannot look up the dielectric constant of FR4 because it is not a material. It's not any one particular material, it's a class of materials. That's why there's always so much confusion, what is the dielectric constant of FR4? And we, people say 4.2, that, that's really just a number that's given out as a random kind of center point to do some calculations for. And, and these are more performance materials. Uh, these are gonna be more costly. Some of them are more uh, lower CTE, uh, better thermal performance, better chemical performance, uh, things for flight. But if you look all, all the way down here at the bottom, the, uh, excuse me, it, here at the bottom, these are the PTFEs, the, these are the Teflons. And without getting into crazy irradiated thermal plastics, you can't get a, 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 dial, you can't get a dissipation factor any lower than PTFE or Teflon. It's got almost no structure. So this one at the bottom, the TACLAM Plus, it's going to be metal backed. So Teflon is a very, malleable uh, material, but it's very low loss, and so you need the structure of that, and so that's why Tacland Plus will be metal backed. Processes on our PC boards. Uh, ED, or electrodeposited copper, is our common copper that we see in our foils for all our PC boards. Uh, the terms RT for reverse treated, or DST for drum side treatment, these are all about getting the ED copper smoother. Rolled copper used to be our go-to for all our microwave boards. Uh, we don't use them anymore. There's just huge manufacturing issues associated with rolled copper. Um, so it, they're still using flexible circuits, but it, they've basically been removed from the use of rigid circuits. Uh, rigid circuit boards now are always treating the copper, the electrodeposited copper, to make it smoother. Ro rolled copper is gone. And, Copper adhesion, um, different smoothness coppers are available for different materials because of adhesion and different material classes. So you have to really work with your manufacturer to see what copper 
what, what levels of copper smoothness you can get in a given material. Edge tolerance, right? You can keep a tighter tolerance on your, characteristic, your characteristic impedances by using a thinner copper weight. But by doing that, you're adding resistance. Um, you can also, uh, a, a common method of uh, making our traces wider without doing that would be to, to, refer, to clear out layer two and to reference a, a, a power or a reference a reference plane that's further away and by doing that, you're making the trace wider for the same characteristic val uh, impedance value. And what that does is it helps with the etch tolerance and also helps with skin effect. And uh, Enig plating, um, you, you may have to, you may have to, uh, you may have to uh, if, you're, if you're removing solder mask from your RF traces, you have to, you have to calculate the plating as well. Uh, usually we go solder mask over bare copper, so the plating process really doesn't happen except at, at the pads. The transmission lines are, are nothing but the copper. So VIPO, that stands for V in pad, plated over. And, and our fabrication drawings, we, we call for that to be planarized flat. From an engineering perspective, uh, VIPO is preferred. You cannot get the inductance any lower in your fan-out connection than putting the via right in the pad. And when it's HDI, it's a laser-drilled via, it's copper-filled, that's even better. That's, that's the lowest inductance you can get. A copper-filled pad directly in the pad. So w there, there's some easy calculations on when we need to control the impedance. And that, that basic rule of thumb is, is when the length of the transmission line approaches 1 16th wavelength of the signal being propagated on it. And, and that's because transmission lines are defined by their length relative to the wavelength of the signal being propagated on them. And, and the first time this really happened was in, with, with, is with the telegraph. The, the telegraph spanned the country, and its signal was, a, was the speed of the telegraph operator's finger. And what happened was they were seeing massive amounts of return loss because the, they were seeing reflections. And what they found was by matching the inductance of the wires on a pole-to-pole on on -pole level with a correct capacitance value, they were able to control the reflection and their loss. And the math that they used is still valid today. If you look at the, at, the, uh, at the transmission line equations, they still, to this day, are sometimes called the telegrapher's equations. And that's what the telegrapher's equations did, right? They broke down that entire span of a country, and they broke it down into two poles length. And that's what the math today still does with transmission lines. It breaks down the transmission line into a theoretically infinitesimally small segment each segment with its own inductance, reactance, capacitance, and resistance. And this is copied across the whole. But this is how transmission lines are formulated. It's how they're calculated. So transmission lines on our PC boards are called planar transmission lines. Microstrip is a transmission line over one ground plane. And strip line is a transmission line sandwiched between two ground planes. Coplanar waveguide is a transmission line with ground planes on both sides. And of course, there's different variations of all these. Uh, usually, we see a ground plane underneath on this, but that's called a grounded coplanar waveguide. There's also mixtures of these. You can have a waveguide and a microstrip, a waveguide and strip line, so on and so forth. So there's pros and cons to using each type of these transmission lines. Microstrip, microstrip is typically wider. Uh, one of the drawbacks to that is that it has, it's necessary to have more clearance uh, to other things because of the radiation. Um, but it's good for etch tolerance, and it's good for uh, combating loss due to skin effect. Uh, the, the microstrip traces, half the dielectric is air. So, so there's another calculation that we use for that, and, it, and it's, uh, it's called uh, using uh, E sub R, or effective uh, dielectric constant. And so microstrip is really representative of, the, of all the old uh, RF boards 
that, that we used to do. They, they would be single-sided. On a, All the signals would be on the top, made all the connections made without vias, and the bottom layer would be, it would be a two-layer board. The bottom layer would be a complete ground plane. A again, before mixed signal came along and we, and we had all the space in the world, these, this is the way we did all our microwave and RF boards, was microstrip. But, but now that everything has to be miniaturized and everything is so close together, strip line really has taken over for much of, of the RF traces. One of the drawbacks with that is that you need multiple layers now and you need vias to make your connections to an inner layer. You cannot do strip line without vias. And what's the problem with vias? It's really easy to inadvertently add stubs. So many mitig stub mitigation techniques have to be thought of. You can use blind vias or back drill uh, or use the correct layer to minimize the stub in, in the transmission line routing path. Another advantage to strip line is since they're buried between two planes, they radiate and pick up less noise uh, when compared to microstrip or coplanar waveguide. So it's really important to group your components by functional circuit when you're, when you're designing RF circuits. Uh, one of the reasons is that uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to minimize the current loop size of that circuit. The other reason that you want to group them together that way is so that another, other circuits don't introduce their signals into that. We can keep better isolation when each circuit is tightly grouped. And it's, uh, it's extremely important to realize the space of each circuit, especially if this RF circuit has to fit in a, in a cavity or in a shield. So grouping them by circuit block is first. And, uh, the, uh, and R, the RF inputs are typically from an antenna or, or from an LO or, or something along these lines from a, from a connector. And, and at many times these RF signals are very low level and very sensitive to any noise. So you're going to put your, most, of your, most of your work uh, isolating and, and getting the front end of, of your RF circuit very clean and very isolated. It's about floor planning. Floor planning helps you decide where you can do things like analog and digital bridges, where to place your power supplies, and how to plan your return paths. Um, th this is, you know, uh, what I've been seeing lately, uh, you see here that we have switching power supplies on the digital section. And then linear or LDO uh, low dropout linear regulators on the RF circuit. And that's typically the way we've done RF circuits for decades and decades. What I've been seeing lately in the past few years is that we're, they're implementing switching power supplies on all our RF layouts now. So we have RF very close to very noisy, potentially noisy switching power supplies. And if you can visualize the overall current loops of your entire system, this is really advantageous. It, it, it helps you minimize the current loops, but also, more importantly, isolate and make sure that other circuits aren't introducing their noise into this current loop. Remember that every signal has a return path, and that is our circuit, is the entire circle. And so it, it helps us to visualize this, this, this loop. In mixed signal designs, we, we want to plan our stack up so that we have isolation. And this is a make or break operation in, in, in a mixed signal design. It, when we get to routing, it, it's too late. We want to plan our isolation at the stack up and, and floor planning stage. Um, and here's an example. So here's a common RF area. So this is common to have an RF area of the board. You, you, the left hand side is, is RF, and, and here we have a, a, a digital side. And then we would, this is showing a moat in the ground plane. Um, it's kind of an old school process to moat the ground planes. If you do this like this, it is un, it's unnecessary. If you design it correctly, it's, it, for the most part, it's unnecessary to moat your grounds or to use separate grounds because the noise contained is going to be, it, the noise, the return path underneath your transmission line is going to follow it. The higher the frequency, the more it's going to follow that trace underneath it. So if you're, if you're designing with, in mind with a return path, that noise is not going to go into other areas. The high-speed stuff will, will be contained if you lay it out correctly. And, and here's, here's another typical situation where the RF is on the top of the board and the digital's on the bottom. 
many instances we would use different materials. This could be a tachyon, that could be an FR4 materials, um, and, or a mixture of both. This is where we have RF on the top, digital on the top as well, so we have a slide, and then we have uh, uh, buried, uh, buried or blind vias. And the whole point is isolating and again, keeping our minds on the return path and the current loops of the RF and the digital so that they are separated by nature. So when it comes to placement, we want to use those strategies that we formulated in the stack up and floor planning phase. Uh, some things to be aware of is if they're high frequency inductors, we don't want them side by side because they tend to couple and create a transformer, uh, creating noise from one onto the other. Uh, uh, transformers as well, you don't want to route metal underneath that on the top side, if at all possible. It's, it's common to say that we want to keep all our, in, in RF, we want to keep all our inputs short. That's not always true. There's a couple circuits that you want the output shorter. A uh, couple might be an attenuator or a filter. You want the outputs to be short on those particular circuits. All other circuits pretty much want the inputs to be short. And where, where to break up circuits, there's, uh, you can talk to RF engineers, but there's, there's usually some pretty good places. And there's circuits that are uh, naturally able to split, and there are things like pi filters or pads, which are groups of capacitors or resistors. And that's typically where we'll split our RF blocks. This is an RF amplifier, and many RF amplifiers will get power injection into the signal. So, so the, the device itself has no power. The power is injected onto the signal itself, and these are, very, these are typically high-frequency RF, low-noise amplifiers. One of the main critical things to, to think about is the return path, and you'll notice that the grounds are on purpose <coughs> facing facing this to minimize the current loop path of that power being injected onto there. But by, you, you really want to really be infinitesimally looking at minimizing that loop path. Fan out is the task we call for adding vias and, and traces, adding vias to connections that need to go to inner planes or uh, inner signal layers or to external planes. That's all part of the fan out phase. But in a mixed signal design, we really want to reduce the inductance into our fan out connections. And the best way to do that, again, is to use VIA and pad. The best way to do that is to use VIA and pad. If you do use VIA and pad and you're doing it to minimize the stub, make sure you're putting the VIA in the pad at the correct location. By putting it in the middle, you're guaranteeing that you're having a stub on one end or the other. You want to look at the path of the signal and minimize the stub by either placing it at one end or the other. Of course, that's a rectangular pad. If it's round, you put it right in the center, right? So for most of our RF boards, we, uh, since the advent of good CAD systems, we've been rounding or radiusing all our corners. One thing we've never done, even back in the 80s, we, we didn't use a right angle. Uh, back in the 80s, they told us you can't use a right angle because the signal's going so fast that the electrons fly off the end of the, of the trace. We, we know that's not true, but it got us to do the right thing for the right reason. Because they were, seeing a, they were seeing loss, it acts the same way. It acts as if the electrons are flying off the, off the trace. What's actually happening is they're, they're cross sec it's just a geometric problem. It's wider here. And so there's an impedance bump. And when you get an impedance bump, what do you get? You get return loss. So return loss looks like electrons flying off the edge of the trace. So we did the right things back in the old days. We just had the wrong reason for doing it. This is something called an optimal miter. And this, this was the way we got uh, away from using right angles when rounded corners weren't available to us. Rounded corners were available when we did tape up. Rounded corners are available to us now, but there was a time the CAD systems were limited and we really couldn't use rounded corners without really seeing performance back, seeing performance problems with the CAD system. This is the formula for the optimal miter, and again, the reason for that is that that is now 
invisible uh, to, the, to the transmission line as far as characteristic impedance. And, and so again, we, we use rounded corners, right? But there's a couple reasons that we would still want to use the optimal miter. And, and one of them would be when the, when the corner is too tight. If the corner is too tight, the, if we have the radius less than a 3W spacing, we get coupling on it. So that's the rule for radius. It wants to be at least 3W. We couldn't fit one here, so we, so we use optimal miters. Uh, the other reason to use optimal miters is to use exact distances for coupling. And here, we, this is a power detector off of, uh, off of an input RF signal for a down converter. And we have exact space, we have an exact distance that we can couple with that, and, and so our power detectors can uh, monitor and detect accurately. So stubs, I, I talked about stubs for a second, but in, in high frequency, we don't want to add any unnecessary stubs at all. Stubs are the enemy. They, they, it's return loss, right? So all copper should be considered RF functional on an RF board, and it should be either stitched to ground or removed, uh, as with fingers and ground plane pores. If you have, if you have non-functional metal just floating, it becomes an antenna and becomes resonant in an RF circuit. Here's some example of some stubs and, and how to remove them. Uh, one of them was with routing. Uh, that's a T-junction that, no, that was unnecessary and creating a stub. So if you did things linearly or, or, in, or serially, daisy chain, you get rid of the stub potentially, depending on what those vias are doing. Placement is another way to have stubs. These are stubs, and we would never do that. In RF, we place the pad right on the transmission line. And if possible, the ground return is, is immediate and with a via in pad. Via barrel stubs can be back drilled, or with sequential laminations, we can come up with a via barrel that has no stubs. Uh, these are some stubs that, so metal is RF functional in RF, so these stubs are made to be RF components. The stubs can be things like quarter wavelength transformers, they can be used to fine tune a circuit. The reason that these, these ones are flared is to improve the frequency response of that stub. But that's what these are as stubs, and those are done by, at the engineering, uh, the engineering level. So stitching, typically we flood the RF circuit layer with ground, and we stitch that with ground vias um, well. We stitch it well to all the other ground planes so that there's no voltage potential across grounds. And, and that flooding needs to be 3H clearance away from the trace. And the reason being is that so that it doesn't become coplanar and change the impedance of that transmission line. For the stitching around it, we make a fence that stitches that ground well around the transmission line, and the general rule of thumb is that we, we place those at a distance of no less than one-eighth wavelength. And that's a distance we can look up, and I'll show you in a second how to do that. One-eighth wavelength is not really what we're after, because there, you can get leakage at one-eighth wavelength. What, what you're really after to get true isolation is one-twentieth wavelength. And this is, we, we have a calculator on our website, uh, I can give you a link to that, uh, which shows, which will help you find out what the wavelength is of a particular frequency transmit, uh, of pr a particular frequency signal on your transmission lines is. The only thing that's left up to you is to put in the actual correct dielectric constant numbers. Uh, just a picture of stitching, um, differential transmission lines with capacitance to fine tune some very high speed, very critical signals. Uh, this, this is a 6.125 gigahertz down converter that we designed. And uh, here it is without the shields. Th this is the one I was showing you about that had the coupling, the power detectors in the middle. Uh, it has a digital attenuator and a low noise amplifier. And then this is a mixer. Uh, if it's a down converter, it's called a mixer. If it's an up converter, it's called a uh, splitter. Um, but it does, it's basically taking the IF frequency and 
taking the data <laughs> off the high frequency and putting it onto that intermediate frequency. So it's, it's mixing it, but it's downgrading. So you'll see that it's a lot less critical when it's l after the mixer. The, the, after a splitter, it's, it, it, on an up converter, it would be the opposite. Down converters and up converters are basically mirror images of each other. Yeah, this is also this is also that same circuit. So this is a this is showing a little circuit of of a low noise amplifier. Arguably, that may be the most important and critical part of your RF circuit is an R is a low noise amplifier. Uh, it, it's just this little thing here that looks like two leads and one ground in between. It looks innocuous. It looks like a passive device, but there's a lot going on here. It's got it's got injection for power coming in, and injection for power going out. It's, an output it's called an output bias network, and you'll see that it's very important that the ground loops of those come right back to the LNA. Same thing with the input. Again, these are arguably the, the most critical part of any RF circuit. Uh, this would be, so in RF circuits, a lot of times we switch between two uh, bands. Th this would be a two, it's typically done with two switches to, ch to ch change between bands. Uh, or frequency bands. Uh, this would be one path that's just the, the default value that goes through, and this is an analog switch, and this is an analog switch. It would bring it through this device, which would which would potentially be a low-pass filter or a high-pass filter, and, and keying in on a different frequency path. More stitching, differential, splitters, just a crazy picture. How are we doing on time? I think uh, that's all I have. Anyone have any questions? Yeah. Yes, sir. When you're talking about having the ground plane in the four axes, yes, sir. Uh, what, which is what axis are you talking about? That's a good question. So in the z-axis on the on the stack up, right? The distance between your tr the distance between layers. Oh, the reference plane. Correct. Yep, to the reference plane. And with the reference plane, you're three layers away and you're